Hello, and you're listening again to Polemics Report for November 26, 2018. This is your host, J.D. Hall. This is the program we hope will be glorifying to God, convicting to sinners, and edifying to the saints. A program with sincere questions and biblical answers. Thanks so, so much for listening in. By the way, I'm fuzzy, so I'm going to change it to this view, which is slightly less fuzzy. If you, don't, if you want to know why it's fuzzy, blame Edgar. It is all his fault. Anyways, thanks for joining us. If you have a sincere question and you desire a biblical answer, email me jd at polemicsreport.com. If we have time, we're going to attempt to answer one of those sincere questions uh, on today's program. We're going to try to answer one of those sincere questions uh, with a biblical answer. Uh, by the way, it is, as I explained before, I had to take a quick technical problem, technical glitch break. It is Cyber Monday, and we want to offer uh, great deals in the Reformed Gear online store. That great deal is if you buy a t-shirt, we will send you a certificate for you to be officially pronounced a scholar in residence at Pulpit and Pen. Now, you may ask yourself the question, uh, what does that mean exactly? And the answer is no one knows. No one knows what a scholar in residence is or what that does, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm talking about uh, Dr. James White. He's now a scholar in residence, a scholar in residence at Apologia Church. And uh, boy, do they need one. So that's good. But if you would like to become one at Pulpit and Pen, order a t-shirt. That's really all it takes. <clears throat> We'd give you one out of a Cracker Jacks box, but we don't sell Cracker Jacks. Well, we sell t-shirts. You can also support the work of Polemics on Patreon at $5.95 a month, $34.95 a month, or $49.95 a month. For $34.95 a month, your first month, you get a free t-shirt. Just tell us what you want out of the store. We'll get it for you. At $49.95 a month, you get a book in the mail, one that I select every month. Last month, you got two in the mail. That's exciting, isn't it? $49.95 a month. Also, we have a special book coming out. That book is called Ungodly Mess, How Marxists Stole Christianity in America. Now, Brandon Howes, as I was explaining earlier, has been digging at us just a scotch, just a little bit, because he's already come out with a book called Marxianity. But frankly, it's pretty much what he's lifted from the pages of pulpit and pen. What he doesn't know is there's a lot of material that's going to be in that book that we've not published yet but it's going to be a killer. You want to read Marxy, not Marxy. Well, Marxianity, I suppose you could. But if you've read Pulpit and Pen, you don't really need to read Marxianity. But you want to read Ungodly Mess. We need a little bit of support to make that happen because we've got lots of interviews and different things like that to do around the country. Uh, during a 17-week sabbatical, I'm going to be going on. And you can donate from our GoFundMe page. Uh, admins post all of that in the links, if you will. Sorry, again, even I think this little me is maybe a little fuzzy. I'm, who knows? Um, who knows, really? Do you know what the gospel is? The gospel is that Christ Jesus died for sinners according to the Scripture and that he was buried and according to the Scriptures he rose again from the dead. Did you know that there's nothing that you can do that is good enough to get into heaven? By the way, there's nothing that you can do that's even good enough to be added to the contribution of Christ. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No good deeds or efforts of your own, all of Christ. So when you close your eyes and you look at this world for the last time, and you open for the first time your eyes in the world to come. If by chance you're asked the question by God, why should I let you into my kingdom? Your answer needs to be, well, really, you shouldn't. By my merit, but I am in Christ, and he lived a life I should have lived for me, then died a death that I deserve, and all of your wrath for me and my sins has been poured out upon your son who rose again from the dead and is at your right hand as my intercessor and high priest. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That being said, here is, what's his face? I don't know. We're just going to get into it tonight. From the Young Turks, uh, somebody else discussed this on a podcast that's slightly more irrelevant, uh, not irrelevant, irreverent than this one. I don't want to necessarily tempt you to go listen to something with some potty language, but here we go. All of them 
Click the link in the description box below. So voters in both Alabama and West Virginia approved ballot initiatives on Tuesday, which was the day of the midterm elections, that will update the state constitutions to declare that abortion rights are not guaranteed. And of course, this is a move that will severely curtail reproductive rights in the states. Now, I'm gonna keep it real. This These ballot initiatives straight out ban abortion. Mm -hmm. As soon as the Supreme Court we wrote about this at Pulpit and Pen, by the way. Let me see if I can pull that up, just FYI. And I'll give you a good explanation of what it is that she's talking about. Pulpit and Pen, the Rolex of polemics blogs. You know what polemics is? Polemics is the field of theological study in which we take what people are saying in the name of God, and we compare that then to the word of God. Uh, it is the work of discernment. We should train the powers of our discernment with constant practice so that we might be skilled in the word of righteousness, as the scripture says. Now, we covered this at Pulpit and Pen. Let me see again. Where did it go? Uh, November 16, 2018, the Ohio House votes to ban abortions after fetal heartbeat is detected. Let me read that again. The Ohio House votes to ban abortions uh, after fetal heartbeat is detected. Uh, by a vote of 58-35, the Ohio House passed an abortion bill, which the Cincinnati Inquirer says would, quote, would effectively ban abortions after the first six weeks of a woman's pregnancy by penalizing doctors who perform abortions after a fetal heartbeat is detected. The Republican majority in the House passed the bill knowing the risks. Governor John Kasich uh, a Republican who vetoed the previous heartbeat bill that made it to his desk could very well veto it again if it comes up before he leaves office or the state Senate could refuse to take up the bill at all. However, if the Senate does end up taking up the abortion legislation and passes, the Inquirer notes to override a Kasich veto, the Ohio House would need 60 votes, two more than the 58 who supported the proposal on Thursday. So effectively, by the way, one Democrat voted in favor of the bill. What? The rest of the Democrats perfectly okay with murdering kids. So they're talking about this. That's the context here. Anyway, I'll go back to this program, an online program called the Young Turks. If the Supreme Court rolls back Roe v. Wade or does away with Roe v. Wade, that's when these ballot initiatives go into effect. Essentially outright banning abortion. Oh, oh, sorry, just got my wires crossed. This is a ballot initiative. My bad, everybody. And I'm referring to the pulpit and pin post that is about the House legislation. Sorry, you got the wires crossed. Anyways, uh, here's the Young Turk talking about it. Now in um, Alabama, it goes a little further because they would give personhood rights to a fetus, a zygote. Right. Uh, fetus, uh, also known in Latin as baby, baby, right? So that's what a fetus is. It's like your it's a, there's a little, there's a little, uh, what's the word for that? What do you, what, when you've got the brain and the separate heart and the uh, person, you've got a little person inside of you, but it makes us feel better when we call it, it's a fetus. It's not a baby, it's a fetus. Really? Because I have never heard or seen a woman on Facebook post a photo like this. I don't, I don't know if I can do it. Let me. Let me make, let's see if I can imitate this. No, you probably can't see it on the green screen. I've never seen a woman on Facebook pose like this and they do the duck lips like. I've never seen a woman pose with her fetus bump. What I, what I see is women posing with their baby bump. But when we're talking about abortion, don't call it, don't call it a baby. We're not having a baby shower. Don't call it a baby shower. The Republicans are listening. <laughs> the Republicans are listening. So don't call it a baby shower. It's a fetus shower. We're having a fetus here. <coughs> yeah. mm. My angry feminist voice heard in my throat. It's not a fetus shower. It's a baby shower. That's not a fetus bump. That's a baby bump, according to everyone. But she wants to call it a zygote. Apparently, that makes her feel better about murdering it. And you know what? Jews, they're not people. They're just a bunch of kikes. They're not really human beings. They're just, you know, uh, hold on a second. What are some 
I'm not really up on racism. You think I would be because I'm called racist all the time. Racist names for Jews. Let's go down the list here. <clears throat> yes, I am. I am Googling. Googling this. Uh, no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I can't say that. I can't. I can't say that. I can't say a lot of these. I, it's, you know what? It's probably not necessary that I say these ra these these uh, uh, slurs. If you wanted to dehumanize a person, you'd say that's not a black person. That's a I can't say it. That's an that's an N word. That's an N word. All right, and that's not that's not a white person. That's a hockey cracker. All right, that's my racist black voice. Hockey cracker. Uh, and that's not a Jew. That's a, that's a kike. And that's not someone from Poland. That's a Polak. Is that racist or is that what they're actually called? Poles. Poles is what they're. Polak is definitely bad. And that's not a Chinese person. That's a chink. You get the point. So it's uh, it's dehumanizing. It's that's not a baby. That's a fetus. All that is is a, that's just the zygote. Is all that is just a dirty zygote. I'll let her continue. Sperm though, sperm is not life. Correct. Sperm is not life. And I remember this from sixth grade sex ed class because a man has never given birth out of his, uh, and if, out of his anatomy. You know what I'm saying? So out of the frontal genital orifice in his body, he has never given birth. It's never spontaneously turned into life. That doesn't, doesn't happen. Actually, that's not life. It's one of the components that if you add it with something else, mix it up, it can become life, but a sperm is not life. Now she looks at the camera like, now is sper sperm is not life is what you're saying? Sperm is not life. That is correct. It is not. In and of itself. Uniquely, an independent life form from the host or from whom it came. It is merely an extension of the one from whom it came and their genetic makeup. It has to be then combined with another individual's genetic makeup to make an independent, autonomous, separate life form. So, yes, did what I want to know is, did not every school have sex ed in like sixth grade? Maybe they've moved it up to kindergarten now. But I specifically remember Miss Breedlove explaining all of this to us. Actually, it wasn't Mrs. Breedlove. She explained that don't kill yourself. That was her talk. I, I explicitly remember Raymond McCleary, the PE coach, explaining this to the boys. Well, Mrs. Breedlove explained this to the girls. Did this girl, she, was she, what, did she miss this? No, sperm in and of itself is not life. Let's continue. Only life as soon as it enters a woman's body. That oh. <laughs> Okay, so apparently I, for the moment, have to be a pastor and, like, a sex ed coach. Well, you don't call it a coach, do you? You don't, it's not like a sex ed coach. It's just coaches are the ones stuck teaching this for some reason. It's not sperm as soon as it enters a woman's body. I don't want to be gross, but that, technically, that's not when life begins. Life begins, to be more precise, at conception. So, um, what comes from the man has to be combined with that which is from the woman, sperm and, and conception, the egg. Conception has to happen in order for life to begin. And then after conception happens, something called implantation happens, with a, which is a, a continuance of that life in which the woman's body is hospitable to receive that life. Uh, this is why uh, married couples, listen to me, or unmarried couples, if you're pagans and you're having sex and you shouldn't be, but listen to me if you're sexually active, you don't want to be on the birth control pill. I know I'm sounding Roman Catholic, but hear me out. You don't want to be on the birth control pill because although hypothetically that should keep an egg from being released, if it doesn't, and a third of the time it fails, it keeps the... Um, it keeps the womb 
inhospitable to implantation of that newly conceived life. So life can be created about a third of the time. So if you're sexually when active during considered that, life, all those people up. who get shot up. She started speaking over me. Can you believe that? That was that was rude. First Timothy, first Timothy two twelve. Third of the time it fails. So if you're sexually active, you you actually conceive a life, a real human being, because like egg plus sperm and. <laughs> They love one another, they get along, things happen, chemistry, biology. And then, unfortunately, it can't implant in the, in the utero wall, so then it dies. I'm getting distracted. The point is, not when it enters a woman's body. All right. <laughs> when specifically conception happens. Okay, I, this is awkward. I shouldn't have to have this talk with a grown woman throughout the country because our politicians refuse to do anything about gun violence. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll back up. A zygote. Sperm, Maybe. though, sperm is not life. No. It's only life as soon as it enters a woman's body. That's when it's considered life. All those people who get shot up throughout the country because our politicians refuse to do anything about gun violence, uh, those people's lives don't matter. All I hate cats. I can't stand cats. Give me just a second to further expound on this important point. When you come home, your dog likes you. Your dog loves you. Your dog is like, <laughs> master's home. I love master. Ah, pet me, master. Where have you been? Master, it's the second coming of master. <laughs> And your dog just wants to be petted and loved and give me attention. And your cat, your cat doesn't care. Your cat doesn't come say hello. Your cat, your cat just looks at you like, what are you doing in my house? And then your cat, the only time it even talks to you, like in cat talk, meow, 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 is when it wants something like food. And then it'll be like, meow, meow, meow. Your dog could starve to death and would not be like, meh, meh. Like your dog knows better than to bark at you. Even you, like you could literally be a, like a bag of bones. Like it's starving away. Like it looks like it was at doggy Auschwitz. And the dog would just look at you with those doggy eyes like, please feed me, master. Please feed me. Hold on a second. How did I get off on that? Oh, I know. I got off on cats and dogs because it's asinine, irrelevant to the conversation and has nothing to do with abortion. Nothing to do with abortion. So, Miss Biology class here. She says, so it's, sperm's not life. Sperm's the only life when it enters the woman. But the people who are gunned down and shot, they're not by, by, by these people who won't, you know, they, they won't pass gun control laws. They're not living. What does, hold on a second. What, what, does, what does gun control have to do with this conversation whatsoever? You can't compare. Like drilling a hole through a baby's skull sucking out its brains, collapsing its head, and dragging it limb from another limb, from another limb, from another limb, murder. You can't compare murdering infants with the right for some people to own a gun because the gun in and of itself doesn't murder someone. They have to employ the gun to murder someone. So. The proper comparison isn't abortion. The babies. You say the babies are real people. I mean, the fetuses and the zygotes are real people. But what about the people who are shot by guns? No. The comparison here would be outlawing scalpels and forceps to outlawing guns. I'm not. Here's the thing. I'm against abortion. It's murder. Lock them up. No, no. That's a waste of tax dollars. Kill them. Get done with abortion legally after a trial when we criminalize it. All right, that's an important caveat. Okay. I'm against abortion, but I'm not for outlawing scalpels or forceps because they can be rightfully used. All right. So don't give me no garbage about, well, if you're really for human life, you'll be for gun control. Would I also, at the same time, if I'm for human life, be for be against scalpel uh, scalpels and forceps? Should I believe in forceps and scalpels control? No, because scalpels and forceps can be rightly used in a medical procedure, so long as you're not stabbing someone through the head with it, just because they're inconvenient and they're a zygote or a kike or someone you don't like because you're just a bigot. 
because they're smaller than you or the wrong skin color. In the same way, you can properly use a gun to defend people and to help one another. It doesn't have to be used in the wrong way. Anyways, uh, making an apples and oranges comparisons. You see that look on her face right there? That is... Uh, whatever little bit of intelligence and thoughtfulness and reasonability that's in her brain, it is, it is leaving, like from the inside, it is leaving her mouth, like, <laughs> but not in the not in the, not in the form of sound, because that's dumb words. I'm just saying, like, an invisible ghost of intelligence is right out the body right there. I just caught it on film. It's uh, photography really is amazing. Children who are living on the streets right now, who have no food. Because Republican politicians believe in cutting funding for food programs like SNAP, those people's lives don't matter. Those children. Just before I started the podcast, I arranged for two families to come to church and get food tonight. So I think their kids' lives matter. Furthermore, I think their kids' lives matter so much that I wouldn't have advocated that they kill their children so as to not to have to feed them. On top of that, and this isn't a political program, but I'm not sure exactly to what Republican program or policy or platform she refers to that Republicans want kids to starve to death. I think Republicans want parents to, I don't know, Stop being lazy, stop being a slave to the government, get a job, etc. I'm not, I'm not really so sure Republicans want kids to starve to death. Oh, by the way, statistically, Republicans give more to charity. So there's that. Lives don't matter. Who cares about them? All of those children who are risking their lives right now to cross into the United States, cross through Mexico into the United States to seek asylum out of fear for their own lives. They're not people. We don't care about their lives. What are they running from? Is it the Jabberwocky or the, hold on a second. I watched the, uh, I watched the Winnie the Pooh movie with my family the other night. Huffalupagus, is that what it's called? Are they running from the Huffalupagus? What are they running from that is taking them all the way from Guatemala uh, into the United States? What exactly? Are they running from again that they can't stay in Mexico when Mexico has offered them asylum? But here's the thing: it's not like little babies are trying to come in and they're like, "I'm lost." I promise you, if any child were to come to a border crossing and wave down a border guard and say, "I don't know where my mom is," I don't speak Spanish. If they were like, "Me, uh, uh, I don't know oh, what. How do you say that?" Uh, donde mama? That's my Spanish. Is that right? Probably not. I had two years worth. Senora Blanca was not a good teacher, if you know what I'm saying, down at the Biblioteca. Uh, uh, donde uh, mama? They would actually, I'm sure, help that child. So no one is against children. We're just against, you know, military invaders using children as a propaganda shield that dumb people fall for. All right. But as long as there's a zygote in a woman's body, that's when it- Baby, there's a baby in that woman's body. Matters. Yeah, I, I don't know if you know this, Anna, that way they can tell you what to do with your body. That's exactly I'm right. I'm sure that was just a random coincidence. It's uh, not about life. I don't care what you do with your body. I'll be the first, well, I mean, I'd rather you not do anything that's going to hurt you, to be fair. Um, our chief concern, speaking as pro-life people, as Christians, is that you not murder people, no matter where they're at. Like, don't murder your neighbor. Don't murder your friend. Don't murder your enemy, for that matter. All right, now we're talking outside the concept of a just war or the invasion of your country. I'm talking about the guy that cuts you off in traffic. Don't don't murder him. All right, that's bad. Even if even if they're black or white or an Eskimo, no matter w what their skin color, don't murder them. Also, no matter their size, you can't, listen, you can't murder midgets because they're smaller than you. You can shoot them out of cannons. You can toss them. 
They have events for that, but you can't shoot them. <laughs> That's illegal and wrong and immoral. And if there's a baby who's a lot smaller than you, you can't kill them just because they're smaller. A smaller. Also, you shouldn't kill someone because of zip codes. I live in Montana. I don't think a lot of Californians, as a general rule, even though there are some really nice ones. Happy belated birthday to Fred Butler, by the way. There's a lot of good Californians. I know four, five good ones. Um, you shouldn't kill them, even the ones that you don't like, based on zip code. And just because the baby happens to live in you doesn't give you the right to violate their body. Because that's homicidal, right? It's okay. never been about life. There might be some good religious people out there who genuinely believe that it's life at the moment of conception. Oftentimes those... Let's back up just for a moment. It's... <laughs> the inference here is that there are some good religious people. There's a couple, maybe who genuinely believe life begins at conception. All right, okay. Everyone believes it's life at conception if they're thinking scientifically. So the agnostic or the atheist is like uh, the skinny guy in Nacho Libre. And they're like, I only believe in science. You don't only believe in science. Because if you believed in science, you'd be like, that's a human being. Life begins at conception. That's when the sperm and the egg create instantaneously. A brand new human being with their own DNA. They're going to develop their own fingerprints, all right? Their own personalities, their own genetic traits. A combination of mom and dad. They're their own intrinsically new, identical, not identical, completely separate, autonomous individual. Scientifically, life begins at conception. We're not like... Like, in no science textbook today, in no peer-reviewed journal, nowhere can you find two biologists going, now, the real question that we need to answer is when does life begin in the womb? Is it six weeks in or is it two months in? Is it the first trimester or the second trimester? If someone overheard, Two biologists having that conversation. When does life begin in the womb? Is it two months or three months? They would be put on the short bus of biologists for the rest of time. It'd be like, all right, you guys figure out how Doritos can taste better and last a little bit longer. Stay away from people, though, because you're dangerous. Life begins at conception. We can argue ethically about when it's okay to murder someone. We would answer never, by the way. You're a Nazi, so you'd probably say whatever you want, or as long as they're little and maybe a different skin color, you can, because your bigotry is bigotry, you can kill them. But the question as to when life begins scientifically, no brainer. Life begins at conception. Welcome to science. Religious people who don't try to force their religion down our throats. But the ones that we do hear from don't really care about life. What they Hey, hey, stop murdering people. Don't push your religion down my throat. Hey, uh, if you could not rape that woman, I know you're bigger and she's dumber and smaller and isn't really self-aware, a lot like a fetus. Smaller, dumber, not self-aware. Just don't rape her. Could you imagine the woman being like, oh, no, you don't. You don't tell me what I can do with my body. Oh, no, you don't. You don't tell me that I can't do whatever I want to do with my body. You don't have the woman who's like, oh, no, that's not right. Stop pushing your religion down my throat. All right, I'll let you get raped. Jeez. Morally, I think it's repugnant that you get raped. But you don't want me to push my religion on you. Here's the thing. It's not really religion so much as it is uh, ethics. And ethically, we think you shouldn't rape people or murder them or uh, you know, like sodomize them. That probably goes along with rape, although I suppose it could be willing. It's still sodomy. Don't do that. Um, we don't think you should steal from someone. 
if I caught someone mugging someone else and I pulled my Smith & Wesson uh, M&P 9 and I'm like, stop, freeze or I'll shoot, you purse-grabbing lunatic, um, it would be nonsensical for someone to say, don't get all preachy up in here, preaching, telling people what to do, getting into our business, enforcing your religion down our throat. It's not religion. It's common decency. That's all it is, like common decency. There it is. Do you see her? It's coming out of her again. You can see the intelligence just kind of coming. It's like wafting out of her mouth. Like You can almost hear it. Eight is the fact that women get to choose their own fate. They hate the fact that women get to control their own bodies. They want to go back to the good old day. I like it that women control their own bodies. It's much easier to make sandwiches, to clean the house, to plunge the toilet, to rub my shoulders. If I had to control their, their bodies, it would be so taxing to do any of those things. When women I'm just kidding. Calm down. Chill out. I will, here's my argument. No one really cares about women controlling their own bodies. We just want you to stop murdering people. You can drive a car, get a job, become a president, whatever. Have, have your Pinterest account, sew, quilt, make brownies, whatever you want to do. Again, I jest. With your body, as a matter of fact, we think you ought to be able to own a gun. We think you ought to be able to, and I, I am stealing this from the podcast where I first heard this reviewed. You can have a Slurpee and a 64 ounce and nobody's going to stop you. If Republicans were in charge, you could even have a plastic straw in it. We'd let you have school vouchers. You could go to school wherever you wanted to. We would give you ultimate freedom as conservatives. We don't want to control your bodies. We just want you to, you know, stop murdering people, Hitler. Emma, not only uh, uh, does it take away abortion, but as you pointed out, but personal, what is the consequence of that? It would criminalize some forms of contraception. So they're going to lock you up if. Okay, so if somebody dies, it's not contraception. Just FYI. You take the wrong kind of contraception. Um, well, I mean, you, you should have your head examined if you live in Saudi, Alabama. Uh, and uh, if you're a woman, get out, get out before Kavanaugh and the other guys take away Roe versus Wade. Otherwise, they're going to take away your rights and they're going to imprison you. Because of their religion. That's what they do in Saudi Arabia. That's the irony is, this is called the Young Turks. <clears throat> and they don't want this country to turn out like Saudi Arabia. Racist! He's a racist! Racist bigot. Uh, again, no. It, 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 just don't po poison your kids. We'll get along fine. I'm a libertarian, man. Just don't kill people. I don't care what you do. Alabama was turned into. So they say, oh, no, no, it's okay because it's not Islam, it's Christianity. No, that makes no difference in our constitution. We're not supposed to establish any religion. If you don't like that, get out of the country. Mm, no. No, I'm not going to get out of the country. You get out of the country. I don't want to get out of the country. You get out of the country. I know this is sounding immature, but no. If you don't like it, leave it. Um, telling people not to murder one another. I know this is redundant. We're going to get to the Bible part here in a second. It's going to get very exciting. Hang in there to pull a mixture report. Hang in. Keep watching. Um, we're not establishing a religion. We're just saying, again, not to be repetitive, don't murder. Right? You don't, well, I was going to say you don't have to be religious to know that's immoral. It's kind of hard to have morality without theism, but I digress. Wrong here, you're un American. Because our constitution, in all those states, and greatly enjoyed it. And I love this country. We feature West Virginia politicians all the time. But I have to be honest with you your religious and political leaders have kept you in ignorance. The Bible is actually pro abortion. That's a. F <laughs> all right. Okay, let's get to this part. Uh, the Bible is actually pro-abortion and we're gonna learn this from a muslim dude so please enlighten me sir 
enlighten me, a Christian, as to the Bible being pro-abortion. It's Numbers 511 to 31. You can read it for yourself. I'm gonna read you just a very small portion of it. But if you don't believe me, that's okay. Now listen to what, listen to this, this is great. I love what he says here. Even Google it, don't trust the internet, don't trust. Don't trust the internet. Don't. Any research, just go pick up your own. Don't trust any research. Bible, wherever you have a Bible, turn to five, Numbers 511 to 31. So this uh, portion says, it's about a woman, uh, and if you're not sure if your wife has cheated on you. If you have gone astray while married to your husband, and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband. Here the priest is to put the women under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry. And your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Dun, dun, dun. The Bible all along has been pro-abortion. And you've been lied to by your evangelical overlords. The evidence is in number 5, 11 through 31. Did you know that the Bible is pro-abortion? Yeah, no, I didn't. So, uh, <clears throat> may the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry. Hold on a second. When who makes your womb? When, when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. We're going to get to that in just a moment. May the water that brings a curse into your body so that your abdomen swells, your womb miscarries. Don't don't freak out. We're going to get to the passage and make sense of it. All right. The devil uses scripture, remember? It is clear as day. There is no... Do you think he understands about the, the water of bitterness? Do you think he... It's clear as day. All right. Okay. No question about it. If you don't believe me, just go read the Bible. It is pro-abortion. It's not... You, sir, are going to hell. And pro-choice, it's pro-abortion. It says if you think your wife has cheated on you, give her a toxic potion and make sure that she has an abortion. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. You're... I'm sorry. It's a sad topic, but he's so stupid. His, I'm going to back that up just a little bit. Listen again. Listen to the, get this guy talk. He's so going to hell if he doesn't repent. Cheated on you. Give her a toxic potion. And you give her a toxic poison. Make sure that she has an abortion. And you make sure that she has an abortion. All right. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Your God said it. Your God said it. Are you going to listen to it or not? Read the Bible. So polemics is the field of theological study. When we take what people say in the name of God, your God said it. Your God said it. No, said it. Uh, no Allah did not say it. Um, and Yahweh did not say it. And the Bible does not say it. You got it all twisted and discombobulated. Like, Satan perverts, we gotta un we gotta he twists. We gotta un twist this knot. So if you got your Bible handy, go to Numbers chapter five. Numbers chapter five. Now, Numbers explains a little bit of the holiness code that was a part of the ceremonial law beginning uh, belonging rather to Old Testament Israel. Okay? Now, this is going to be boring, like eye crossing. This is going to be like listening to Leighton Flowers level boring. Okay. This is like Jordan Cooper boring. This just, it, but it, he, you know, he, he with eyes to see, let him see. So, by the way, speaking of Bible thumping wingnut, if you're listening, you're listening on the Bible thumping wingnut network. I was talking to Tim Hurd today, and he said that in a podcast he recently recorded with Len Pettis, who, by the way, is the uh, latest resident scholar at Pulpit and Pen. 
He said that Leighton Flowers explained, in his view, that when he shares the gospel, that is giving them ears to hear. So the evangelist is the one giving people ears to hear and eyes to see. <coughs> Heretic. Okay. Test for adultery. And the Lord spoke, like, being born again is a supernatural act. This denying or denouncing, it's muddying the doctrine of regeneration. You would think soul winners in the in the uh, semi-Pelagian camp would understand the importance of being born again, but they got no idea what that means. I make people born again. I give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Okay, all right. Uh and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel. If any man's wife goes astray and breaks faith with him, if a man lies with her sexually, and it's hidden from the eyes of her husband, and she's undetected, though she has defiled herself, if there's no witness against her since she was not taken in the act, and if the spirit of jealousy comes over him, and his wife is, excuse me, and he is jealous of his wife who has defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy overcomes him and he is jealous of his wife, though she's not defiled herself. In other words, whether he thinks she has and she has, or whether he thinks she has and she hasn't. Either one. If he can't overcome the jealousy because he thinks his wife has played the whore, then, verse 15, the man shall bring his wife to the priest and bring the offering required of her, a tenth of an ephah of barley flour. He shall pour no oil on it and put no frankincense on it, for it's a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of remembrance, bringing iniquity to, rem to, uh, to remembrance. The priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord, and the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel, take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and unbind the hair of the woman's head and place her in the hands of the grain, excuse me, place in her hands the grain offering of remembrance, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And in his hand, the priest shall have the water of bitterness that brings the curse. And then the priest shall make her take an oath saying, if no man has, has lain with you, and if you have not turned aside to uncleanness while you were under your husband's authority, be free from this water of bitterness that brings the curse. But if you've gone astray, though you're under your husband's authority, and if you've defiled yourself and some man other than your husband has lain with you, then let the priest make the woman take the oath of the curse and say to the woman, the Lord make a curse and an oath among your people. When the Lord makes your thigh fall away and your body swell. May this water that brings the curse pass into your bowels and make your womb swell and your thigh fall away. And the woman shall say, Amen and Amen. So let me cut through all that to explain the Bible's not pro-abortion. That's not what this passage means. And then we'll look at some other places in case you have a friend that's crazy enough to think the Bible's pro-abortion on account of this. This is ceremonial law. They weren't guided by the Holy Spirit uh, directing their heart in terms of how to deal with forgiveness and jealousy and anger and retribution and reconciliation. This is prior to the coming of, of the, uh, the Holy Spirit. And so things are a little bit different. So you got a husband who has in his mind, his wife has cheated on him. Maybe she did. Maybe she doesn't. So he brings her before the priest and he makes an offering on account of his jealousness. You with me so far? The priest takes water. It is, it's, it's water that's used for religious purposes. It has been, uh, uh, I don't know if I want to say blessed, but it's, it's holy water. And he takes that water in an earthenware vessel and takes some dust from the ground. All right. It's with the water. And then she drinks it. And the woman says an oath. And the oath is her promise that she's not cheated on her husband. Now, if she has cheated on her husband, the curse applies to her. The curse shall be among her that her thigh should fall away. I'll get to the text in a moment and demonstrate that and explain what it means. Her thigh shall fall away and her body will swell. All right. 
May this curse pass into your bowels and make your womb swell and your thigh fall away. And the woman shall say, Amen and Amen, which means, let it be. Let it be. Now, there is a certain supernaturality to this. This can't be explained naturalistically. It has to be explained supernaturally through the office of the priesthood. This wasn't uh, mere hocus pocus that anybody could do. This was reserved for a ceremonial function of the priest. If the woman had played a whore, she'd drink this water and she would, well, I'll explain what it means to say, her thigh shall sink. And her stomach, or her body, rather, swell. She'll get sick. If she's not cheated, she'll be fine. Now, he used the term miscarriage. He was drawing from the NIV, which is pretty much the only translation to call it miscarriage. Even the NLT, which is not a translation, it's a paraphrase, it says, he will cause your womb to shrivel and your abdomen to swell. I guess I just need to address this now. What does it mean, your thigh shall fall away? Like, if you don't speak Greek, use the Young's literal. It's, it's as close as you're going to get without speaking Greek. Uh, <clears throat> Jehovah's giving, quote, thy thigh to fall and thy belly to swell. Thy thigh to fall and thy belly to swell. The King James says that the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly swell. And you're like, thigh to rot? How do you get mis miscarriage from that? All right. This, I'm excited about this. This is, this is exciting. You're going to learn something new tonight. So in the Bible, and I've already demonstrated this in various blog posts, and I've podcasted on this. Matter of fact, let me see if I can find it. In the Bible, the thigh is considered nudity. God considers Isaiah 47, uh, verse 1 through 3. That's the verse I'm looking for. Nudity uh, encompasses the bearing of the thigh or leg. This is why... In modesty, I don't think your wife or young women or old women, especially the old women, just kidding, shouldn't be wearing short shorts. I have extended family, and I see their kids in short shorts. I'm going, really? Why don't you just have them run around naked? Can they not wear something to their knees? That's fundamentalist. You're a fundamentalist. Hey, listen. I'm not throwing stones, literally. I'm not hitting you with anything. I'm just saying, in the Bible, thighs are considered to be nudity. As a matter of fact, when God is embarrassing the nation of Israel on account of their sin, he speaks of making bare the leg and uncovering the thigh. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. But this term thigh, as it's used here, is referring to... Referring to <sighs> the groin area, it's speaking of her lady parts, as the King James phrases it, rotting or <sighs> maybe I should just stop. According to the ESV translation, uh, it's making her lady parts shrivel and hang low, which is not exactly a sign of healthiness and is more common among promiscuous women because they've used it too much. May your lady parts dangle and shrivel and rot by drinking this and may your, may your belly swell because you get sick. All right. Now, the NIV translates this, or excuse me, interprets. It should say it's an interpretation. It's interpreting the abdomen swelling uh, and the genitals rotting and getting all gross and stuff as miscarriage, but that is merely an interpretation. That's not necessarily substantiated in the text. But either way, here's what I want to point out. 
It's not that man, the husband, as the Turk here says, should make sure your wife has a miscarriage. This was not an abortion toxin, you moron. This wasn't like RU486 or Plan B because then even the innocent woman would have a dead baby. No, she's made to drink this. If she's guilty, this happens. If not, nothing happens. They didn't have the Holy Spirit, couldn't, uh, they, they, they had no natural, excuse me, supernatural recourse internally of the Holy Spirit helping them deal with such things. Uh, as jealousy and uncontrollable anger and speculation and doubt and skepticism in a marriage. This is how you dealt with it, with the priest. And we assume that God was at work and whether or not they would get sick. That's just the, the way that it works. Now, let me read from John Gill just to demonstrate this was not an abortion elixir of some kind. The priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causes the curse. Not the water, not that the water was bitter itself. It was water out of the laver. It had nothing in it but the dust of the floor of the tabernacle. It was holy dust. It wasn't like it was arsenic, okay? It wasn't wormwood. It was dust from the floor of the tabernacle. It's pretty blessed. It's like it's the, if you're going to put dirt in your water, it's the, probably the best dirt to put in the water. So it's, it's, there's no poison in the water, and the water in and of itself isn't bitter. It's made bitter by her drinking it and being guilty, and she has promised out loud, if I am a whore then, or promiscuous, if I've cheated on my husband, may I get sick? Amen and amen, let it be. Well, then it becomes increasingly bitter. Some think the bitter was put into it, so... Ben Gersom as Wormwood, but and this is John Gilligan, but it is so called from the effects of it, of those who were guilty. It produced sad effects in them, bitter and distressing. It made them appear to be accursed ones, for it was not bitter until it entered them, in a citation of Numbers 5.24, whereas it was not so to the innocent, nor attended with any such consequences to them. So this isn't a husband shoving an abortion pill down someone's throat because even the innocent woman would receive this and they'd be fine. It was God himself. Now, even if you want to interpret the abdomen swelling as miscarrying, if that's what you want to assume, then that would be on God, wouldn't it? And by the way, one of the unfortunate consequences of sexual promiscuity is difficulty in childbirth, or I should say in carrying a child, or a, a fetus, or a zygote. Carrying the zygote might be especially difficult for someone who's been sexually promiscuous because of various diseases, and I don't want to get into the grossness of that, and HPV, and a bunch of other stuff, but that's how that text should be rightfully understood. What does the Bible say about abortion? I don't know if I'm going to get to the topic of Rebaptism, maybe I will. I might save it. We know throughout Scripture that the Bible, um, or rather that God, not only affirms the life of the unborn, but holds it sacred. It is God, according to Isaiah 44, 24, who forms us in the womb that he is making us inside our mother's womb in the same way that he is stretching out the heavens. We are his creation. He has made us specifically for him. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 tells us that God knew us as he formed us. As a matter of fact, it says before he formed us in the womb, before we were born. That means even before you could look at the zygote or the fetus, and see it shaping into a human even before that formation started to happen. This isn't teaching you existed before conception, like a Mormon might teach. Even before that forming really happened observably to the human eye, God knew you. Even while you were yet to be born. I think about that for a minute. It's amazing to think that God knew us, that we were what? How do you know? You don't know a lump of cells. You don't look at a tumor and you're like, me and that tumor, we're tight. 
I named the tumor. It's my friend. It's Bob. Bob the tumor. You don't do that with a tumor. But yet God knows you. Do you know why? Because you existed. In order for you to exist, you must be a person. Do you get that? You must be a person in order for God to know. You don't, you don't know things. You know, like in terms of relationship, you know people. But perhaps the most powerful reference in the scripture relating to this is Exodus chapter 22, excuse me, chapter 21, verses 22 through 25. When men strive together, they hit a pregnant woman. Let's say they're fighting and it gets out of control. The pregnant woman's trying to break it up. She gets smacked. Her child comes out and the child's okay. That guy's going to be fined. I mean, after all, he hit a pregnant woman. Even though the kid's fine, he's fined. He's got to pay. But if there's harm, then you shall pay life for life. Eye for eye. Tooth for tooth. Hand for hand. Burn for burn. Wound for wound. Stripe for stripe. That's why in our country, in most states anyway, to injure a fetus or a zygote, also known as a baby, you're punished as though you hurt a real person because you did hurt a real person. And everyone knows it. Now, there are no exceptions to this. No exceptions to this. What about children that are created via incest? What about exceptions for rape or incest? Deuteronomy chapter 24, 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for their own sin. So their father's a rapist and an incestuous pervert. Right. S don't kill the kid. Are you saying that I have to live with this person inside me for nine months? Yes. Don't murder someone. It stinks you were raped. Awful. Horrible. Tragic. I'm sure. It doesn't permit you to kill someone. Why? Romans 3 8 tells us, not to sin so that good may come. Don't do evil so that you can... In other words, the ends don't justify the means. I want to have this over with. I'm sure you do. If it's any consolation, we should be putting those guys on the fast track to death because we should be killing the guilty and letting the innocent live. And ironically, the same people who are not for protecting innocent infants are the same people, without a doubt and almost without exception, who are trying to vacate the death penalty for the wicked. No, you got it backwards, man. You kill the guilty. <laughs> you let the innocent live. What's wrong with you? You got it, the, got it twisted. Life begins at conception. So the question is, what should you do and what part can you help to play in the abolition of human abortion? First of all, go to your local abortion clinic and preach outside. Don't pray the rosary. Don't just stand there and talk to yourself like the uh, Roman Catholics do. Preach. Contend for lives that are going into the building Hold back those, as the scripture says, who stumble towards the slaughter. And secondly, vote for whatever politician is willing to ban abortion. And not just ban it. It has to be criminalized. That means there has to be a penalty attached to it. Let me explain this real quick. When Roe v. Wade was decided, I was going to say passed into law, but the Supreme Court doesn't make law, of course, and whether or not they even have the right of judicial review, I think is highly questionable and a part of the 14th Amendment, which was never constitutionally ratified. Yeah, I just said it. Um, never constitutionally ratified. Either way, when Roe v. Wade was passed, the majority opinion of the Supreme Court 
determined that the Texas law prohibiting abortion showed um, inconsistency in that while claiming abortion was murder, it didn't punish abortion doctors to the same extent as any other murderer and didn't punish the mother at all. Therefore, the Supreme Court um, came to the conclusion that abortion must not be murder. Because if it was, you would put abortion doctors on trial for murder. Not just medical malpractice. You wouldn't just take away the, their medical license. It's Texas, man. You'd fry them, man. You'd get a tall tree and a short piece of rope. And the mother and the father that contracted the kill, you'd put to death if it was really murder. So because it wasn't criminalized, because it, you couldn't be punished, you just have a slap on the wrist, the Supreme Court said, must not really be murder then. You must not really believe that. The only thing that will end abortion in the land is its criminalization. Now, Russell Moore said, listen, nobody wants to punish abortive mothers. Nobody wants to punish the women. I do. I do. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to punish any woman. But if you contracted with someone to kill your kid, yeah, I do want to punish that. Assuming you've committed the crime. And the penalty should be death. Because it's murder. And the Noahic Covenant, still a thing. And if you shed blood, then by man your blood should be shed. We can't do that with Democrats in office. We can't do that if the Gospel Coalition and Tim Keller have their way and Republicans stay out of the next election. The answer ultimately will not be politics, but there is something that the magistrate should do to help the situation. And that is the magistrate should do their job, according to Romans 13, to not bear the sword in vain, but to bring vengeance upon all of those who do wicked. And our contention is that includes those who murder children. We'll say it even if nobody else does, because it's what we do. Thanks for listening to Polemics Report. We're not going to get to it this time. Next time, I think I'm going to answer the question, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. If you were baptized before you were saved, should you be baptized again? We'll answer that next time. Contribute, if you can, at Patreon or the GoFundMe. Either one would be a big blessing. You should be able to find all that stuff on the Facebook page. Buy a t-shirt on Cyber Monday, and we'll send you a free certificate so that you, too, can be a scholar in residency. Very exciting stuff. It won't get you into heaven, though. Thanks for listening, everybody. God bless you. Until next time, as always, Simper Reformanda.